much, and thank you to the friends of Tewksbury Public Library for hosting me here. Got to let you know I'm all thumbs, so I'm, I have my clicker here, but this is a talk about pandemics, a world history. If I were to speak about every single pandemic that struck the earth over the last 10,000 years, it would take me 10,000 years. So I've selected some. I love ancient history, and I tried to draw parallels from events of 100 years ago, of 400 years ago, and even 3,000 years ago, how we can correlate to what's going on in our lives today. So as Robert told you, um, in five-time Boston New England Emmy Award winning uh, host as, and writer and co-producer of the TV show, The Folklorist, you can go online to see it, www.folklorist.tv.com. I was very blessed to work with some talented people. Um, that's the same Joseph A. Banks suit. You buy one, you get four free back in the old days. It's just a different tie and I didn't shave. And uh, we are very, very lucky. I was blessed to get 20 Boston New England Emmy Award nominations, which means I lost 15 times. <laughs> That's my own OCDs. But also I received 12 Tele Awards, seven Communicator Awards, and New TV out of Newton, Massachusetts, where this program was produced. They went back to back nationally in arts and entertainment 2015 and 2016 uh, for the first place in the Alliance for Community Media. And unfortunately, like all TV shows, it was a critically acclaimed TV show that nobody was watching and it was canceled in 2016, but I just had a great run. I'm so thankful that I had a chance to do that. I've been called many things, some that I cannot say on TV, but um, a time traveler driving without a license, the old Boston Phoenix said that about me. And as Robert mentioned, I've, I've been blessed to be a professional sports show announcer. I've worked uh, 26 years with the Boston Bruins alumni, the National Hockey League alumni, including the Toronto Maple Leafs, Montreal Canadiens, and most recently, recently the Detroit Red Wings. And um, this season, uh, it would have been my 25th season with the New England Patriots as their basketball announcer, and sometimes we do softball. But um, I did get to the major leagues for the Red Sox. I did one game June 5th, 2012 against the Baltimore Orioles as the public address announcer. And I also got to announce outdoor winter legends classics at both Fenway Park and Gillette Stadium. Uh, comedy Basketball Hall of Fame. I did a lot of comedy basketball and I also MC golf events. I like to call myself a historist or a folklorian because it's not fair to the historians that are degreed or authors or folklorists that have degrees. So I made up this term, all are welcome, historist folklorian. Uh, I have all sorts of specialties, uh, including historical weather, astronomy, economics, ecology, inventions, warfare, history, African-Americans in the military, Native Americans, biblical archeology, span exploration, athletics, disease, disasters, hoaxes, unexplained mis mysteries and whatever. So um, as my wife said, when she married me, she didn't realize that three of my other personalities were waiting for us down in the car. Um, I belong to a number of historical societies, Waltham, Marshfield, Duxbury, Dedham, and Watertown, including my favorite, the Society in Dedham for Apprehending Horse Thieves. And in 211 years, they've never apprehended a horse thief, but they have a great annual dinner. I'm also a proud member of the acting collaborative Solo Together, which has uh, historical reenactors. I portray portrayed badly Alexander Hamilton, but they still let me hang out with them. And I'm a former colonial reenactor with the Lincoln Minutemen. Uh, I, uh, participated in every single reenactment uh, historical battle in the Massachusetts area and it was a great run um, for me to load and fire my musket I think it took me like two minutes and 30 seconds I'm not quick enough and uh, I'm great at cocktail parties for about one hour before I am politely asked to leave <laughs> so, so welcome yeah. okay so uh, I'd love to hear from you there's always somebody uh, for my presentations who knows more about the subject than I do. So feel free to contact me, John Horrigan at hotmail.com. And, or you can follow me on Facebook at J.R. Horrigan. It's John Horrigan, historian, pro sports announcer. So this is a text driven lecture. I work a lot with mature adults of which I'm one now. Um, it's a text driven presentation for the benefit of folks who may have difficulty hearing, or if they're poor listeners like myself, my wife will tell you that. Any audio or technical issues in the production of this presentation are due to my lack of technical acumen. All thumbs. So Robert's off hook. But maybe one day, one day maybe, I'll be able to make a live presentation to you. Um, when we talk about a world history, I've taken just six epidemics or seven uh, to talk about tonight. So we'll look at some prehistoric epidemics, ancient epidemics, which I consider before the common era, BC, before Christ. Middle Ages, we'll look at the conquest, the colonialization of, of America and what they brought with them, and the Spanish flu. 
so you've heard these terms, um, endemic, epidemic, pandemic. An endemic is of a disease or a condition. It's regularly found among particular people or in a certain area. An epidemic comes from the Greek word epidemios. And it's, uh, it's uh, something that is inflicted upon people. It's a widespread occurrence of an infectious disease in a community at a particular time. And finally, a pandemic is of a disease prevalent over a whole country or the world uh, from the Greek word pandemos, which means all people. So that's what we're going through right now. COVID-19 has just taken a few months to sweep the earth. And how many will fall ill? We don't know. How will society change? We don't know. History reveals that pandemics have reshaped civilizations in profound ways over the past 10,000 years as hundreds of millions of defenseless humans have been taken by disease. Now, this is a, a painting here by Thomas Cole, one of uh, five paintings he made uh, in a series called The Course of Empire. This is destruction, and essentially, it, it allegedly depicts um, the uh, Vandal raid on Rome, which uh, began the collapse of the Roman Empire in AD 455. But due to pandemics, empires have fallen. Governments have crumbled. And you're going to see a lot of Correlations today. Generations have been decimated and left psychologically devastated by disease, pandemics. So yeah, 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 get on with it. Okay, so like you, I'm a historical enthusiast and researcher. I love history. That's why we're all here tonight. I'm not a virologist, a pathologist, or an epidemiologist, but I do confess that I need a haircut. <laughs> Before we examine a chronology of the epidemics and pandemics that have renamed the world and remade the world, let's look at its dance partners, the dance partners of pestilence, war and famine. It breaks my heart to think that man, I, I've yet to find a female army, has killed each other for over 10,000 years. In fact, um, recently in the past six years, a ancient grave site was found in Kenya that re reveals a brutal, violent end for a group of humans, males, females, and children that lived 10,000 years ago and they were massacred and thrown in a pit. So that, that, that we haven't learned in 10,000 years, that really, really troubles me. And then the other thing is, um, what, what we forget is, and we're going through it, is that ancient Egypt was powerless in the face of the earliest recorded famine that helped to bring down their civilization and the pyramid builders around 2180 BC. So essentially warfare has been around for 10,000 years, famine uh, for almost a little over 4,000 years that we know of. Now this is a painting by Peter Bruegel the Elder called The Triumph of Death circa 1562. Every time I look at this, and it's, it's, it's really frightening, and especially in the background, maybe on your own time, you may want to look at it, but um, it just shows he was going through um, the medieval times. Uh, the, the, the people there had endured several different outbreaks and plagues, but uh, it's one of the most troubling images. Now, you've heard about the four horsemen of the apocalypse. They're figures in Christian faith. They appear in both the Bible's Old and New Testament, and they're considered to be punishments of God. Ezekiel called them the sword, the famine, the wild beasts, and the plague. I think that the wild beasts could also pertain to a man. So, but like any old Western film, and during this containment, I've gone back and looked at the Western films, although they are very misogynistic. Um, eventually, these plagues, the four horsemen of the apocalypse, get chased right out of town in a full gabbit. Gallop. So don't you worry, we'll get through this, okay? So what we're going through right now is not, is not the end of the world, okay? And I mean that. I mean, this isn't a, a commercial with sad piano music on it. I sincerely mean that from my heart in light of what's going on in our nation over the past uh, week or so, fractious need. So the fears, the frustrations, and the isolation that you are currently feeling are no different than the emotions felt by our ancestors during times of epidemics, 100 years ago, 400 years ago, 1,000, 3,000 years ago. What you're going through, it's natural. Now, if I said this to you a year ago, you'd say, you wouldn't know what I meant. Now we all do. The world fell and smashed into 8.45 billion pieces like Humpty Dumpty, and we need to put ourselves back together again. 
And part of that is the, the, the we, our, our ultimate goal as humans is happiness, isn't it? And uh, maybe through, through love, through sharing, through forgiveness, uh, through kindness, treating others the way you want to be treating, maybe we can get back there. Okay. So since ancient times, humanity has en endured these unforeseen plagues. Okay. And we're no different. They got through it. We'll get through it. Okay. And stay positive, stay safe. And please note that you are not alone. You're not. The sun will rise another day. One of my favorite lyrics from a Pearl Jam song written by Eddie Vedder. Throughout recorded time, epidemics and pandemics altered human history. Not solely through illness passed between humans as pandemics have also affected the animal kingdom. They've reduced the food supply and led to famine and starvation. For century, humankind had little means or no means to protect themselves from pandemics. They had unsanitary practices and conditions. We know about our hand washing. They had superstitions, forced segregation. They ostracized people that were sick. They blamed others and they had total ignorance. And all of these were supplanted in medical thought and medical practices as well. So let there be peace on earth. Let there be peace in me, peace in you, and peace in all of us. And if I could sing my favorite karaoke song, All You Need Is Love, I'd do it. But that comes up later after I have an IPA. Okay, so, but major breakthroughs in medicine came in the 20th century that has literally saved over a billion lives. Some of us, I was born in the early 60s. I got an inoculation, I remember that, but I, I've known no polio. Um, personally now, as, as, I, as I reach the age of 60, I've endured uh, medical issues um, with bronchitis, Etc. So this particular disease as a historian or historist, um, when I start hit, I got scared and I have sheltered in place, wore a mask because I am one of the vulnerable people and uh, maybe uh, the, the Grim Reaper will pass over um, this time for me. But uh, it's, it's very, very frightening. And thank God for medicine. Thank God for the frontline workers. Thank God for the doctors and all the food service people, the truckers, the people, the uh, policemen, firemen that are keeping us safe. So without you, we would be doomed. So, but our ultimate protection against disease is immunity. Now, I got this from the epigenetic, uh, epigenetic principles of evolution, second edition, 2019. Here we go. Immunity is a state of resistance of an organism to invading biotic or abiotic pathogens and the harmful effects that prevents the development of infection and maintains organism's integrity by counteracting, neutralizing, and clearing pathogens. <clears throat> I'll try to stay out, no more technical talk. I'm not gonna get into <clears throat> a deep into DNA and the different diseases, I will mention them, but I'm gonna look at the sociological and historical impact. We're going to look at in this uh, talk, and I don't hope you don't mind this hitting water. It's filtered water, though, reusable bottles. The Neolithic decline. Hamin Manja, Miaozigu. Look at Sweden. We'll look at something known as Yersinia pestis. So there was a period known as the Neolithic decline. As you know, farming, uh, the humankind, when, when they stood up on two legs in that savanna in Southern Africa, and they looked, stood on two legs to look over the tall grass so they could see animals. And then after that, they became uh, herders, nomadic herdsmen, hunters and gatherers, and eventually they settled down and, and, and figured out how to farm and domesticate animals. And across Europe and Asia, there's evidence of increased populations in ancient, what they call mega settlements of 1,000 people or more from 4,000 to 3,000 <clears throat> BCE before the common era or BC before Christ. If I use them interchangeably, I'm just using that whatever's easier for me. So they've been discovered and these newly advanced civilizations suddenly abandoned their villages as their populations nosedived. Was it an exploitation of resources in some cases? Was it conflict with another warring tribe? In some cases, was it due to disease? In some cases. Hamin Manja, and I may, I've heard it pronounced three different ways, Hamin Manja. About 5,000 years ago, an epidemic wiped out a prehistoric village in China. 
as the bodies of the dead, and again, this is a very morbid subject, and this is the only morbid photograph I hope to show aside from depictions, but they were stuffed inside a house that was later burned down. In other words, it showed sign that these were infected corpses, infected human beings, and uh, they were in fear of getting infected themselves, so they disposed of the bodies. But no age group was spared. Skeletons of juveniles, young adults, mature adults, middle-aged people were found inside the home. And the archaeological site, now known as Hamin Manja, is one of the best preserved prehistoric sites in northeastern China. An archaeological and anthropo anthropological study indicates that the epidemic happened quickly enough that there was no time for proper burials and the site was never inhabited again. Frightening. And that's part of the reasons why the authorities had to uh, react with speed about this. But even before the dis discovery of Hamin Mangcha, another prehistoric mass burial that dates back to roughly the same time, 3000 to 4000 BC, uh, was found at a site called Miyajigu, and that's in northeastern China. So together, these two uh, archaeological discoveries suggest that a major epidemic took place. And also they believe that they found the oldest known strain of the plague. Um, again, I don't want to get into the diseases, but when we talk, there's three virulent strains of the plague. There are the pox, the chicken pox, the small pox, there's yellow fever, there's cholera, uh, salmonella. Um, you're gonna hear me just drop a couple of disease names or a few on, on you here tonight. So anyways, then in Sweden, just a couple of years ago, researchers examined the DNA of two people who were found in mass graves dating back to 3000 BC um, in Scandinavia. And it was determined that they succumbed to a bacteria now we know as Yersinia pestis. Now, Yersinia pestis is a bacterium with no spores that can affect humans via the oriental rat flea or by rodents or by fleas or not with mosquitoes, but just by fleas. And it causes the disease that we call the plague, which takes three main forms, pneumonic, septicemic, and bubonic. And can this disease stay dormant for thousands of years only to resurface? Uh, some speculate that that maybe a, Ebola was a, a, a disease that was uh, dormant on the floors um, uh, of uh, in Africa in some ancient forests, or even in the Amazon, there are some hidden diseases that may emerge if we continue to, to forge into the interior and, and, and literally rip out the lungs of the earth as we decimate the Amazonian forests. Sorry. So ancient, if we look at ancient epidemics, we're going to talk about the plague of Athens. We're going to look at the Antonine Plague and Justinian's Plague. So the Plague of Athens hit in the summer of 430 BCE. And the plague, as most plagues are, was brought back from Africa by returning merchant ships or returning troops back to Greece. And Thucydides, as a historian, described the people who suffered from fevers, uh, redness in eyes, bloody tongues, bloody throats, and ulcers. Now, we can rule off the plague of Athens, whatever hit them didn't, is not hitting us right now because those are not symptoms that we are exhibiting. So many of the people who lived outside of Athens, though, had to move inside the city walls due to the second year of the Peloponnesian War between Athens and mighty Sparta. And if you think back just a couple of years ago, I mean, packed into stadiums and rooms, and even for a lecture like this, I've been done in historical societies and old homes, and, and we're literally on top of one another. It's frightening. But um, they all came in to the city, everybody in, and when they came in, they came in with their diseases. Um, 100,000 people died in five years, 25% of the population while Athens was under siege by the Spartans, but also the people in Athens at that time, there were contributing factors uh, along with the diseases that were brought in, um, unsanitary conditions, which uh, uh, the bacteria can fester in, um, of course, starvation, thirst, um, and uh, fatigue. So. so anyways, this caused fear, it caused panic, and it caused lawlessness in ancient Athens. Does that sound familiar? Now, bacterial agents examined in their RNA, RNA is, and again, I'm not a virologist, it's similar to DNA, 
Um, it, it decomposes very quickly. It's been found in ice cores. We've learned a lot about the Earth's climate, as you know, by drilling ice cores. Uh, learning about uh, I'm learning about these things every day, like the day that the uh, the sun didn't rise, the uh, the Earth went, the moon went dark in the year 1110 AD. I can go on and on. Love historical astronomy, but anyways, um, it suggests that the plague that struck them. In addition, they had periodic bouts of typhus, okay, tuberculosis, anthrax, and salmonella. And these diseases were mostly carried and transmitted by fleas on rats. But you need to understand this before we move on to the great dying later on in my talk, is that for thousands of years, human beings live with animals. And animals, especially uh, poultry, swine, uh, even bovine cattle, horses, uh, goats, um, the six main animals that humans cohabitated with for thousands of years. And with those animals came their uh, diseases. And over the centuries, families and uh, nations, towns, villages built up immunities. And when you look at some of these plagues, <clears throat> I'm not going to get into it, but there are some villages that weren't touched. They, nothing. Nobody got ill. Um, there are some age groups that didn't get ill. But these diseases, when the explorer came over, when the Western European came over for conquest, originally through the conquistadors, in Mesoamerica, Central America, Mexico, South America. Um, they brought the diseases with them. They brought their animals with them. And for instance, uh, pigs were released uh, by uh, the expedition of, I believe it was uh, Coronado. And then they proliferated throughout the southern part of the United States. And I, I still don't understand this, but then somehow today's modern Arkansas Razorback, the teams are named after that, had these fangs underneath them. But they, they better watch themselves if there's still a pork shortage. And then the other thing is <clears throat> horses uh, that, that some of the Spanish conquistadors, uh, it was basically Hernando de Cortez, 1519, Cortez the killer, um, on his uh, move through Mexico to slaughter the Aztecs in the Antenno Chichlan. And uh, some horses got free. And by uh, 150 years later, there was over a million horses roaming across the central plains of the United States. Okay, so I've digressed and I'm burning time. The Antonine Plague, <clears throat> it took place in 165 AD. Roman soldiers returning from a campaign in Mesopotamia, that's modern day Iraq, they brought a great pathogen back with them and it would take the lives of two Roman co-emperors. One is Marcus Aurelius Antoninus, and if I don't get a haircut, I'm gonna soon look like that. And the other one is Lucius Verus, and I, or I might look like that. But it was a great pathogen that brought fever, bloody stool, blistering, rashes, skin pustules, and plunged Europe, Asia, and North Africa into chaos, the known Western and Eastern world. 10 million died, and this is a guess. The historian uh, uh, Galenus, he describes some type of measles or smallpox, but the historical record shows that measles don't show up until about the 11th or 12th century, and they evolved from something known as the Rinderpest or Rinderpest virus. About 25% of the people who contracted the disease died in the pandemic, ravaged the Roman legions in Gaul and the Germanic lands. From 165 to 180 AD, some people even say 190 AD, at least 5 million died. And during the height of the pandemic in Rome, 2,000 people died per day, according to the historian Dio Cassius. Now, the weakened Roman legions were unable to contain the Gauls and the Germanic tribes south of the Danube River. Of course, um, uh, they were decimated in the year 8 AD um, when they went through the uh, Tudorborg Forest. <clears throat> Another story. But they traded with Han China, and in the Indian Ocean, uh, all their trade was curtailed. Merchant vessels weren't going out, namely because there was a quarantine in place, but also there were, didn't get enough men to get on the ships. They were too sick. And then there were countries that were not permitting these ships to come in, especially in the Far East. And, and, and China had gone through these diseases for a thousand years before Europe. So eventually, 10% 10, 10 of the Roman population succumbed during this pandemic. And the Roman army death rate was about 15%. And there was a decline in business and trade across the empire. And perhaps it was the foundation for the fall of the Roman Empire that would take place 300 years later, uh, depending upon 407, 442, 476, you pick your date of the fall of the Roman Empire. <clears throat> now we move to the plague of Justinian. 
And 40% uh, of the population was affected or infected uh, in the years 541 and 542 AD. I will tell you that in 537 AD, there was a series of volcanic events uh, around the world that actually darkened out the sun. And uh, you can look at these accounts up, I want to say 536, 537, but where the sun didn't shine due to the volcanic activity. Always worries me uh, that Mother Nature, she's going to cool herself down, right, by uh, uh, releasing her volcanoes. Uh, and we're also in another dormant period of sunspots, again, another lecture, but I believe that sunspots, um, active sun, uh, increases the temperature here on Earth. But anyways, the Eastern Roman or Byzantine Empire, Rome in the West, Byzantine in modern day Turkey, um, the, they were stricken by a plague which killed an estimated 25 to 50 million people. It struck hardest at Constantinople, in, which was the center of the Byzantine Empire, and it spread to various Mediterranean ports, right, by merchants, merchant marines, and it was carried uh, by ships involved in any international trade. The ships also carried rats. These rats were infested with fleas, which were the source of the disease and the pandemic that spread from China across the Eastern Empire. So this is, aside from the pandemics that I told you in China, this is the first where they, they trace it to trade. And you're going to see it when I talk about the Silk Road. But the first wave lasted until 542 AD, and additional outbreaks occurred sporadically well into the 8th century. Now, Byzantine historian uh, Procopius, he estimates that 10,000 uh, deaths occurred in Constantinople daily when the plague was at its height. And of course, the weakened Byzantine Empire was unable to maintain the union with the Western Europe uh, Empire, the Western Empire, uh, when the Lombards in North, Northern Italy invaded and it eventually brought about the consequential fall of Rome. Constantinople would, would essentially be the center of the Eastern Roman Empire up until the year of 1452. And that's what caused Columbus to look west for a trade route. So another historical impact of the plague was the settlement in Great Britain by the Anglo-Saxons. And following the plague's initial outbreak, grain prices skyrocketed in the Eastern Empire as men strong enough to tend crops were scarce. High prices, sound familiar? Uh, the uh, bag of groceries, as you know, for, from a year ago, what it costs you now, if you can find groceries. So the Byzantine armies, hard pressed by their enemies from all directions, including the Goths, the Huns, the Lombards, the Persians and Arabs, suffered a series of setbacks which shrank the empire. And Justinian, for whom the plague was named, he contracted the disease and he survived. And had he not survived, maybe uh, Christianity would not have survived. Just a thought. You can see, you've seen this about the plague though, the doctors or the, the witch doctors with wearing a mask as if they could scare out in the Middle Ages the virus from people. But anyways, let's talk about some epidemics of the Middle Ages, including the Black Death and the Great Plague of London. The Black Death, it was also known as the Pestilence, the Great Mortality, and it was the most fa uh, fatal pandemic recorded in human history, resulting in the deaths of up to 25, maybe as high as 200 million people in Eurasia and North Africa and in Europe, essentially from 1347 to uh, 1351. Now, the bacterium which caused the plague of Justinian was, again, we mentioned it earlier, Yersinia pestis. But it was a different strain of the virus that, than that which is commonly known as the Black Plague, though it was the same virus. That's a bit of a contradiction, but let me explain. There are three types of plague bacteria. Bubonic plague. Within two to six days, death would come due to swollen lymph nodes or buboes, high fever, headaches, and vomiting septicemic plague in the bloodstream, and it causes blood clots, which turn tissue black. Then there's pneumonic plague. It reaches the lungs, invokes bloody coughs, and brings rapid death. Now the Black Plague was bubonic plague and entered Europe from Asia and then spread to North Africa. So again, all due to trade routes. And uh, it originated in China, spread west along the Silk Road, which is a long road, um, as I mentioned, it was closed off in 1452, causing uh, merchants to find another alternative route. They didn't want to take the maritime route around the Horn. It was too long, too costly, too dangerous. 
Um, so the uh, Silk Road, that's where all the pilgrims went across, the merchants, and it became too unsafe for them due to disease, but mostly due to the, uh, the thugs that were along the Silk Road that would rob pilgrims, rob merchants, and even kill them. But this was also carried by rats in the hulls of merchant ships. And by the middle of the 14th century, it was in the Russian steppes and the Ukraine. And it was so deadly, for two full centuries were required to recover the loss of the population it caused. It was the end of serfdom because no longer could these wealthy earls say, you work my land, I'll give you a percentage of your crop. Mm -mm. You were the one uh, writing out uh, who are you going to work for, dictating the terms. So at least 75 million people succumbed. Some estimate the deaths to have numbered over 200 million, which included up to 60% of the people of Europe. 100,000 people died in Paris, and Germanic and English settlements suffered death rates of 60% and upwards. And the death rate obviously depleted the workforce. Crops would rot in the fields. You're hearing that, aren't you? Uh, in the absence of workers to harvest them, or, or because they couldn't get there, the costs of food increased and starvation ensued. So monasteries and convents, just as our frontline workers, the nurses, the doctors, the bus drivers, the, the gas station attendant, the girl at the supermarket, the person in the fast food restaurant, uh, uh, the people, person behind you, um, they were the, the, the people and the priests and the nuns that tended to the sick because the sick fell upon the, under their auspices. They were the first infected. And um, they were struck down first and clerical establishments were abandoned because they were the first hospitals for all intent and purpose. And there are climatologists who speculate the Black Death contributed to the Little Ice Age when fields formerly in crops returned to their wooded state. <coughs> it actually cooled the planet down. There are several um, perturbations and if you look at the, the long history of the climate of the earth, it's more of a sine wave, but in more recent times we're seeing sawtooth extremes. Let's get to the Great Plague of London. It lasted from 1665 to 1666. It was the last major epidemic of the bubonic plague to occur in England. You probably heard the story that there are some field mice in the southwest in Arizona or something that carry it. I've heard that throughout my life. But anyways, this happened within a centuries-long second pandemic, which was a period of intermittent bubonic plague epidemics, which originated from Central Asia in about the year 1331, and it was the first year of the Black Death and an outbreak which included uh, uh, other uh, deaths like pneumonic plague and it lasted to the year 1750. Now I'm not gonna talk about colonial, if I were to talk about diseases of New England, maybe that's another one. Um, there are so many smallpox epidemics, cholera epidemics that hit Boston, especially smallpox. In fact, that was one of the reasons that caused the British to evacuate Boston on March 17, 1776, because uh, his, the troops were getting sick. Boston was rabble anyways, and Washington came in with some troops that uh, were, had been inoculated or at least showed some resistance to the smallpox. But the Great Plague in London, 1665, 1666, and I guess if there's time traveling periods, I would have loved to have seen a Shakespearean play in a theater while Shakespeare was still alive. I'd probably be a groundling right in front, right? Anyways, um, almost a quarter of London's population perished, 100,000 people in 18 months. And there it is again, Yersinia pestis, the bacterium which is usually transmitted through the bite of an infected rat flea. Now, the 1665-1666 the epidemic was on a far smaller scale than the earlier Black Death pandemic, and it was remembered afterwards as the Great Plague, mainly because it was the last widespread outbreak of bubonic plague in England during the 400-year second pandemic. And its transmission was halted in, mostly in due part to the Great London Fire of 1666. Um, the rats scattered. In the, the people that perished, perished, but it, it literally burned out the disease. Now we move to the conquest, and, I, and we have about 15 minutes left here. When the Europeans came across, it, it was the, the Portuguese were the first to take slaves on the coast of Africa. Then the Europeans came across, and they were driven by that precious metal that has spilled so much blood, that has driven men insane. 
it even caused the population of the United States to move west. Gold! And in comes Fernando de Cortez, Neil Young song, Cortez the Killer, uh, the Pizarro brothers, uh, and all the conquistadors looking to, 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 to take your gold. First, you got to pray to our God the way we do, or we'll have to kill you, but show me the gold. And that's our sad beginnings here. And uh, they brought their illnesses. They brought their guns, their germs, their steel, their lies, their alcohol, their forsaken promises, their aggression, their religion. But in the 16th century, a series of severe droughts also played, uh, plagued Mexico. So again, they, throughout my research, it's, it's, it's war, it's famine, it's climatic uh, that contribute to disease. They all, they dance around the maypole of death, it seems. And um, Mexico went through a, a drying period um, in, in the 1500s. And in their aftermath, a recurring disease struck in the indigenous people, the Native Americans, indigenous tribes, First Nation people. If I say the term Indian, I do not mean that uh, in a disrespectful way. I mean that in an honorable way. Um, their Spanish conquerors and the African slaves that they took to raise their cotton, pick their cotton, raise their tobacco, pick their uh, tobacco, uh, raise their sugarcane, pick their sugarcane. Um, they would... Uh, Brought, brought the African slaves into New Spain, which was Hispaniola, the Caribbean islands that were discovered. And eventually when they uh, landed in the south of the United States from Florida westward to Texas and of course into Mexico. The Aztecs called the disease Cocolistli. Say that, Cocolistli, I for white men. And it, for centuries speculation was that this disease was a form of hemorrhagic fever carried by the Vesper mouse. There are those dirty rats again, which flourished in the rains which follow the droughts. Again, climate change, if it's too hot, too dry, too wet, there are a lot of diseases that are born in wet areas. But um, more recent scholarship um, has identified the illness and speculated, and I still think this speculation is a form of salmonella. But the disease spread throughout Mexico. And similar symptoms emerged in other regions of New Spain, suggesting to some the disease originated with the Spaniards, you think? And they brought it from Europe. And the disease that they brought back to Europe was, that they got from, um, from the Mesoamericans, syphilis. Okay, so the symptoms they suffered were similar to those presented in other diseases, including typhus, measles, smallpox, yellow fever, um, and then the, the quote, one of the historians said, God sent down such a sickness upon the Indians that three out of every four of them perished. We think that's wrong. Some estimate that up to 90% of the indigenous peoples of Mexico died of the disease combined with the effects of droughts and the Spanish conquest, or maybe 2.5 million or maybe 50% of the 5 million population that inhabited uh, Mexico and the uh, 12 million that inhabit all of Mesoamerica um, during the late Middle Ages. Okay, and I want to just check time here because I might, okay, so we got about 10 minutes. So I want to talk to you about the great dying. dying. Um, how ironic is it? 400 years ago, it's the 400th year anniversary, just a few months of the pilgrims arriving here. And when they came, they found bleached bones on the beach. They, they, actually wanted to go to New Amsterdam. They were, the winds blew them north along the Cape. They decided to throw anchor. They wrote something known as the uh, Mayflower Compact. They went ashore. Um, the reason why they went ashore was they ran out of beer. They were looking for fresh water because water in casks on a ship can, can contain a host of diseases. But they'd eventually find corn, dig it up on Corn Hill. They leave a note saying that they pay them back, which they did. And I call that the first act of American credit. And then finally on First Encounter Beach, they looked down the beach, 16 men left the Mayflower in a shallop and landed on the Nauset Beach. And they, they looked down and there were six Native Americans with a dog. And for a timeless moment, they stared at each other. And kinda, I wanted to, if I was back there and I did this for my show that I'm working on now, my documentary, The Pilgrims, is I run down the beach yelling, get your men and women, men of the Nauset, go to the woods now leave now. These men, uh, it's the men behind them that you need to be worried about. But when the pilgrims came, there was a great dying. They found uh, the village of Plymouth known as Patuxet, uh, decimated. Uh, in fact, the only one that survived from the, the village happened to be uh, a Native American who was captured, Squanto. And if it weren't for Squanto to show the pilgrims how to plant food, the three sisters, um, you know, squash, 
and, and beans, uh, they would have died. So that disease, if you talk to historians, they say that the outbreak that they called the Great Dying that took place from 1618, uh, 1616 to 1618, just before the Pilgrims drive in 1620. I think different. Uh, hist historians and the people in Plymouth Plantation will tell you that it came from the main area, the Northern New England area brought by French explorers and troops, uh, explorers rather, and um, uh, priests, and it spread southward. But I think that a, 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 an epicenter, a, a patient zero, was also in Patuxent in Plymouth because John Smith of Jamestown, the great bragger, the great exaggerator, um, he was lucky, but he came up the coast in 1614 with two ships to map the New England coast, okay, in 1614. And uh, he had another ship with Thomas Hunt. Thomas Hunt was a bad man. Like uh, early settlers, as soon as they arrived, they started conflict with the Native Americans, stealing their food and their grain because they didn't bring over any farmers to farm the land that they knew nothing about in the acidic so uh, soil, et cetera, et cetera. But Thomas Hunt, John Smith, by the way, filled his ship full of uh, over 10,000 beaver pelts because fur was a cash crop too. And also 10,000 cod and he went back to England. He left this guy, Thomas Hunt here. And I believe that Thomas Hunt anchored in Patuxent, modern day Plymouth, there was a patient zero on board his ship and that's where the disease sees. So, so by the time they came back, the pilgrims came back in 1620, the disease had run its course. Okay, so gone off book here. But among the discovery, uh, discoveries the pilgrims made were cleared fields that were empty of crops as if it were sent by God, by providence. Wow. And these were cleared by Native Americans. And it was a once thriving population that was a stark, comparison to the relative lack of natives. And this is the Wampanoag Federation. There were different tribes under the great Sachem or chief Massasoit. In my area, I'm coming to you from Auburndale, Mass, just along the Charles River, uh, the Massachusetts Indian here, the Pequasset, et cetera. But uh, down in that region, uh, it was uh, Wampanoags and, and uh, they were gone. And for some of the English settlers, they thought it was a providential miracle. And God had swept away the natives before their arrival, an act which made the land more fit for the English nation to inhabit, if that's not imperialism. And good, we're right on time here, so we're going to wrap up and I'll definitely take questions. Um, the Spanish flu. Uh, it was March 9th, 1918, that a soldier walked into the barracks at modern-day Fort Riley, feeling sick. By noon, the infirmary had dozens of soldiers. Quick quarantine, quick lockdown took place in this, in this now Fort Riley, Kansas. Everybody stays in place, except for the officers. The officers leave. There's a staging area in Fort Devens, Massachusetts, and uh, the Surgeon General at the time happened to be there, and men were dropping getting sick. These are very young men, not an age group or people that were susceptible to disease. They were, they were young men, breathing strong, young men in the morning, and they'd be dead that night. So the Spanish flu, which was named after Spain, I'll touch on that, uh, only because they were the only people that were telling real news during the war. There was a blackout. Uh, it was a phase of fake news for defense, but um, they, that's why it got the moniker Spanish flu. It didn't emanate from Spain. Uh, but um, they were the only ones to report it. So they said now there were three specific waves. San Francisco went into lockdown. The Southwest went into lockdown. The first wave that hit Massachusetts seemed to dissipate or go away with the troops. Although we do know in September 1918, when the Red Sox had won the championship with their lefty pitcher, Babe Ruth, that three people dropped dead in the streets of Quincy at the docks. So either way, it goes across there. It infects all the uh, soldiers. It, there's three different waves. They come out of lockdown in San Francisco in the, in the Southwest too soon. People that had beaten rounds one and two got sick. So anyways, 100 million deaths are attributed to the pandemic. That's considered by some to be low. At least 500 million contracted the disease, a quarter of the globe's population. Um, the, the first year of the pandemic, the average life expectancy in the United States was reduced by more than a decade. And wartime censorship prevented the uh, press from describing the flu and its virulent nature in 1918. They didn't want the Germans to know. I mean, it was one of the reasons why the World War ended, the First World War. And again, Spain, neutral censorship, censorship didn't apply. And uh, because they reported it widely, it was called the Spanish flu. But in truth, the disease was likely born in France, although other people will say it came from Asia, 
mainly China, uh, and that, that was the epicenter, the troops staging camps at, at Etapo, or Etaple. And that makes sense. Again, it's being transported, but the virus spread quickly among the troops in part due to the crowded conditions in the camps, trenches uh, across Europe. Uh, I hope that you got a chance to see the movie 1917. What an amazing film. But um, infected troops moved about the con continent and then they hastened it spread. And of course, if they were wounded, they brought it back to the hospital. And then if they were sent home, they brought it back home. So in the United States, troops in training contracted the disease likely from contact with instructors from Europe, officers from Europe. And as the troops moved to the seacoast for shipping to Europe, the disease came with them. And over 30 million Americans contracted the flu and estimated 650,000 died. By comparison, just under 117,000 American soldiers died in combat or later of their wounds during World War I. And over 63,000 additional American troops died during the war, the overwhelming majority of them from the Spanish flu. So um, I just want to ask if you have any poignant and direct questions that I can provide vague, ambiguous, and irrelevant responses to, the Artful Dodger. But in closing, hey, we're vulnerable to any disease at any time. Be safe, be smart, and stay positive, and you're not alone. Peace be with you, my friends. And now, come at me, bro. Come at me, sis. I'll try to dodge the question. Thanks, Robert.